So, with the release of Dune Part 2 and the inevitability of Dune Messiah, aka Dune Part 3, I've been thinking about the fact that that, when it comes out, might eventually make Dune one of the, if not the greatest movie trilogies of all time. It's something really special that we rarely get to see in modern day cinema. These massive epic trilogies that just work on every level and build off of each other and just become a complete and utter brilliant package. And because I've been thinking about that, I've also been thinking, what are the best movie trilogies of all time? So here we are, we're gonna make a video about it, and I'm gonna break down what I believe are the greatest movie trilogies of all time, kind of my opinion on this matter. Now before I get into it, I have a couple rules with this trilogy, a couple different standards that I've set for myself. First up, these movie trilogies all need to be movies that are connected. They need to be sequels to each other. They cannot be spiritual trilogies. For example, the Cornetto trilogy that Edgar Wright did, those movies technically are a trilogy. They feature the same actors, they feature similar de themes, but they are not connected in any other way, story-wise. There are three separate movies, so that will not be here. I will also be only counting trilogies that have three solid movies. So what I mean by that is The Godfather is not going to be listed here. Well, you, obviously, The Godfather Part 1, Godfather Part 2, incredible, incredible masterpieces, but Part 3 is a stinky piece of poop. So that will not be on this list. I want complete trilogies, trilogies that have three good to great movies that are full entire packages. So I have a list of eight here, and I wanted to say before I also list them out, I haven't seen every movie trilogy ever, so let me know what yours are down below, your favorite ones uh, of all time down below. If they're not listed here, I probably just haven't seen them. So let's get into it. The first two here are not entirely in order, but definitely like the top four, I kind of put in a better to worse order, but just keep in mind, you know, this isn't a definitive ranking here. These are just all what I consider the best. So let's get to the first one. The Matt Reeves Planet of the Apes trilogy, I feel like, goes very under-recognized in modern-day Hollywood. It is an absolute accomplishment of filmmaking, both in this modern-day version of filmmaking, where everything is special effects and motion capture and everything, they kind of revolutionized motion capture in a way that other films have definitely done, kind of like the Lord of the Rings films with Gollum, but in a way that no film had really kind of, had truly understand to bring out the amazing, perfect performances in all of these mo-capped characters. The only other thing similar to this in connection is kind of like the Avatar movies with James Cameron, but this is a trilogy of films like this that have incredible performances from actors who appear as apes, because, you know, they're not actually, you know, appearing as people. They're not people in costumes like the original ones. These are fully CG'd, mo-capped characters, but the performances specifically from Andy Serkis are incredible. Now, that's just the technical aspect of these trilogy. Now, that's just the te technical aspect of this trilogy. These three movies are brilliant. First, we start with Rise of the Planet of the Apes. This is a Planet of the Apes movie that takes place before apes have really risen, like at all. You know, the title, Rise. And we follow a young Caesar as he's being raised by his, you know, surrogate father and James Franco. And we sort of see how the apes became smart, how they got this ability to think as good as humans do and how to talk and all this stuff in this slow sort of rise, yet again, <laughs> using using that word. And this movie is great. This is a movie that I loved as a kid, but I felt like nobody had seen. I would always talk about this movie around my friends, around other people, and they would just look at me like, like what? Like, <laughs> what is this movie? Like, nobody saw it, but it's fantastic. It's such a great movie. It's easy to watch. It's probably the easiest to digest of these three movies, but it definitely is thar dark. It's dark on themes of corruption, of animal cruelty, of how we treat uh, species or even people that we think are lesser. Uh, it really is a terrific, terrific movie. I think the relationship between James Franco's character and Caesar is really beautiful and quite remarkable, and it's kind of sad that they didn't bring that back up in, in the future movies in this trilogy, but this is a great movie. And obviously you get the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which in my opinion is the best Planet of the Apes movie ever. It's the best movie of this trilogy. It's an incredible piece of work that takes place deep into kind of like this post-apocalyptic uh, human world where humanity's just been kind of destroyed by this virus and they're barely surviving. And we have this weird little group of survivors that come into contact with Caesar and this very, very smart group of apes that have kind of become their own community and their own civilization. And there's really this sort of first conflict between the two entities. And Caesar is really just a strong leader that wants peace, and the whole film's about this descent within his own ranks and within the apes, and descent within the humans that all want different things. Performances in this movie are incredible. The movie is dark. It's a little bit of a slow burn, but in a good way, but it ramps up to a massive action-packed third act, 
and, and this is just a masterful movie that does not get enough credit. I definitely think it's Matt Reeves' best work uh, to this point in his career, and it is a phenomenal film. I am convinced that the only reason Matt Reeves got to do a Batman movie was because of how good Dawn of the Planet of the Apes was. This movie is fantastic. And then we get the trilogy ender, War for the Planet of the Apes, which I personally think is the weakest of the trilogy, but it's still a fantastic conclusion to the story of Caesar. This is an epic movie. It is huge. This thing is almost three hours long. It's really slow at times, similar to the Dawn, and you definitely feel the slow burn more than you do in Dawn, which is why I think it's a little bit worse. But the movie is still fa you know, fully packed with so many great moments, great performances. Woody Harrelson gives an awesome villain performance here. You get Caesar yet again trying to be a leader of the apes while humanity is still kind of kicking in this post-apocalyptic type world, still coming into contact with the apes, still coming into conflicts with the apes, conflicts within themselves, conflicts within the apes. Like, there's just so much conflict everywhere, and it's sort of dealing with all that conflict and trying to come to a peaceful point where the apes get to be happy, the humans get to be happy, but is that even possible? So we have this massive, massive war type situation, and it's just a movie that kind of hits all of the beats of the previous two movies and leads to a conclusion that makes a lot of sense and kind of pivots into what's going to be the next trilogy, which is obviously starting with Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. This is a great movie. It ends a perfect, an almost perfect trilogy, and uh, it leads into what will hopefully be a new trilogy, which will be just as great and just as epic as this. So Planet of the Apes definitely deserves to be here. Matt Reeves, Planet of the Apes. Then we get to number seven. <laughs> Four Trilogy is a remarkable accomplishment of filmmaking, and it's something unlike any other trilogy on this list or any other grouping of films ever. These movies are truly special and truly unique. Richard Linkletter obviously writes and directs all three. Linkletter, who's one of the most unique filmmakers in the world, he's made some incredibly out there and risky movies. Movies that span 20 years, took 20 year plus years to film, and then movies that are fun, like his newest film, Hitman, which I got to see at the, at the New York Film Festival. These movies, though, really highlight the type of filmmaker he is with experimental writing, experimental filmmaking techniques, and just great, great understanding of human emotions. The whole idea of this trilogy is it's just Ethan Hawke and Julie Depley's character just kind of walking around different locations and talking for an hour and a half. It's, all, it's pretty much what all three of these movies are. You're just watching these two people interact over the course of like a day or a night, and that's it. But it works so well because Ethan Hawke is so incredible and Julie Depley is also amazing and their chemistry is probably the best on-screen chemistry I've ever seen ever in Hollywood. You just, it's so believable that these two are in love and are together and as it evolves over the three films, it just becomes so real and it feels so amazing. Now obviously we start off with Before Sunrise, which many people would argue is one of the best movies ever. This movie is utterly perfect in its writing, in its filmmaking, in its performances. It is remarkable. You really need to watch this movie if you've never seen it before. It's obviously about Ethan Hawke and Julie Depley as they meet in Vienna on a train ride and they sort of just have this remarkable like day together and night together as strangers who just met in this weird place, kind of got stranded there, and it's a remarkable love story. You have some of the best moments I've ever seen in a romance movie. This movie made me feel very lonely. God damn it, man. This film really is iconic for its long takes where they just sort of let the camera roll on these two characters and let Ethan Hawke and Julie Depley really go for it where a lot of it feels like it wasn't scripted, and I'm still not really sure to this day, you know, maybe somebody can let me know in the comments, if there was a lot of improv improvising in this film, because there are just some long, long scenes that feel way too organic to be scripted. So either you had Richard Linkletter writing a brilliant script, or you had Ethan Hawke and Julie Depley doing some of the best freaking improvisation ever in filmmaking. Either way, it's brilliant, and the chemistry and all the vibes are amazing, and it all leads up to a great ending, that bleeds into the second film. Of course, that's Before Sunset. This is also a remarkable movie, but a very weird movie. This movie feels a lot shorter than Before Sunrise, and it feels almost kind of like a peek back into these two people's lives versus kind of like this grand story on this one night like the previous movie was. This movie feels like just kind of like a walk in the park where we're listening to a conversation, and then it ends. But it's so damn great! Actually, researching for this video, I went back and I was watching clips from Before Sunset, and I was just blown away by how good the writing is and how well performed it is. This is legitimately the best written trilogy, the best written dialogue, I think, in any movie. It is brilliant. You could teach a masterclass in screenwriting on these films, but specifically Before Sunset, as these two characters reunite after years apart, and we sort of uh, see them grow back together, fill in the gaps of where they've been and what's been going on. 
their personal lives, but that chemistry is still there, the love still blossoms, but there's more conflict than the last movie, but it all resolves into a great ending. And then we get into Before Midnight, which is the trilogy ender as of now. There might be another one in the future, but we get Before Midnight, which is a very, very different movie than the previous two, because Ethan Hawke and Julie Depley are now together, they have a family, and now they have to deal with marriage and the problems around being together with each other with each other for so long. It's a very different type of movie, but it still has those same writing amazing moments. Like, the writing here and the dialogue is still perfect. The way they interact, the chemistry between each other, the fights, that it's just so much deeper than the previous two when it comes to how it studies relationships and marriage, and it's brilliantly done. This trilogy is amazing, and I probably should have ranked it a little bit higher. Go watch the Before Trilogy. Now we'll get to number six. Now, I gotta be honest before I really talk about this. I haven't seen Back to the Future Part 2 or Part 3 in a very, very long time. So my inclusion of these films on this list is simply because I want to acknowledge that it deserves to be on this list, just from, you know, the opinions of everybody. But yet again, I can't really speak towards it myself because I haven't seen these movies in a very long time and I'm not really familiar with them. I am very familiar with the first Back to the Future. I've seen it a million times. It's one of those movies that can be considered a perfect, perfect film. It's a film that has really revolutionized a time travel type plot in Hollywood. There are so many different films that have tried to recreate that. Of course, you have Rick and Morty, which is a show that's completely based off the, the structure of characters in Back to the Future. You have some of the most iconic scenes, iconic imagery, in Hollywood. There's freaking theme park rides based off this movie. It's just an icon in Hollywood. And then you have Back to the Future Part 2, movie that I don't really remember too much, but I do know they go to the future, and I do know they say that the Cubs won the World Series in 2015. They missed it by one year. I don't remember too much about the movie, but I know it's absolutely beloved. And then we have Back to the Future Part 3, which takes them to a Wild West type setting. Yet again, haven't seen this one in a long time. I can't speak too much to it, but I know people love it. They love the whole trilogy, and it's considered one of the most iconic films trilogies in Hollywood history, and it's one of the best time travels, you know, series of films and franchises there is. So I wanted to mention it, despite the fact that I, I can't really speak too much to it like I have the previous two. So let's get on to number five. This is another trilogy that I, I can speak to in a sense because I have seen all three of these movies. This is not one of my personal favorite trilogies of all time, but I am here to acknowledge the fact that it is one of the best Hollywood movie trilogies ever made, and if I didn't include it, I would just be silly. That would be stupid. Obviously, Indiana Jones is absolutely incredible. It is a massive franchise that despite best efforts of Kathleen Kennedy and even Steven Spielberg at one point, it cannot be killed, it cannot be stopped. This is essentially James Bond, but treasure hunting. That's essentially what the Indiana Jones movies are. It follows the same structure as those Bond movies, those early Bond movies, and that's what we pretty much get here. Now, Raiders of the Lost Ark is a movie that I do love. It is an incredible piece of work and it's practical filmmaking. The filmmaking in the sense that everything you see on screen is as real as it could possibly be. It's Steven Spielberg working at his absolute best when it comes to action adventure style films. You have Harrison Ford who oozes so much charm, so much charisma, and so much energy that you just can't help but love his character in this film. His relationship with the female lead in this movie is really good. The actual adventure of looking for the Ark of the Covenant is great and the Nazis make for easy bad guys that do work, you know, for, you know, for the most part. I mean, the music is obviously brilliant and iconic. The ending of this movie is really great. It's just a phenomenal movie, and it's for people that grew up on this movie, it's one of the most, you know, important films in Hollywood history, and I am openly admitting that. Then we get to The Temple of Doom, and this is a movie that I personally don't love. I'm just gonna be honest, I kind of lose, you know, interest in Indiana Jones after we get past Raiders of the Lost Ark, personally. But I am here to openly admit that people love this movie. It's another big grand adventure. It's a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is one of the reasons that I kind of lose interest in it. Uh, but yeah, it's another big Indiana Jones adventure that people really love. It has all the practicality of the first movie, and Steven Spielberg is still at his best. Then you have The Last Crusade, which is a more emotional movie in the trilogy. It's a father-son story, and it is the closing act of the Indiana Jones cycle, with Indy literally riding off into the sunset at the end of the film. And they never made a fourth movie or an even worse film fifth movie produced by Kathleen Kennedy and Disney. That definitely didn't happen. No way. 
Uh, this is a movie that I enjoy. I don't love it for the same reasons, and I think it still follows that kind of mold of films, like the early James Bond films, and of course Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's just not really for me. I kind of get lost in the adventure and sort of lose interest after a while, but it's still a classic Steven Spielberg action film. It's a classic Steven Spielberg adventure. Harrison Ford is still at his best, and this movie definitely has more of an emotional gut punch than The Temple of Doom, I would at least say. Now let's go to number four. These top four are definitely my favorite four trilogies ever. I'm very excited to talk about them, so let's get into it. You've got a friend in me. You've got a the Toy Story trilogy, another trilogy that definitely didn't have a mediocre follow-up fourth film. Nope, no way, didn't happen. Toy Story is a very important series to me because I grew up watching these movies. I was a kid who used to watch all of these films almost every day. I was obsessed with Toy Story as a little kid, and it has stuck with me to this day, the emotions and the vibes that I had felt as a kid when it came to this series. Now, of course, we have Toy Story 1, which in my opinion is the movie that made Pixar what it is today. It is a perfect animated movie, an emotional, incredible adventure of these unique characters who are these toys that come to life when their owner goes away. It's a very unique concept that always, always just amazes me how they got it to work so well. Of course, you have these iconic characters in Woody and Buzz Lightyear who were all introduced for the fr first time. You have iconic sequences like when they go to like the, the pizza arcade or whatever and they get the alien, the claw, all that stuff when they get picked up by like the bully and everything. There's so many iconic things in this movie that are amazing. The animation, although today does look a little older, it still kind of holds up for a film that came out in the 90s. The emotions definitely do, the writing definitely does, and this is still a great movie that has a lot of great themes and a lot of great vibes. I can't wait till I have kids one day and I can show them Toy Story 1. But then we get the Toy Story 2, which essentially takes the first movie and just kind of builds upon it. And I will say Toy Story 2 is my least favorite of the trilogy. I think it's the one that I watched the least in my life, but it's still a great adventure that takes our characters and sends them to another location. You have Woody who kind of gets kidnapped and is being, you know, in a toy collection thing or whatever. You have like a fight or whatever through an airport. This is a lot of crazy shit going on in this movie that I really love, and it's still amazing, and it definitely holds up. But then you have the best. You have the best of the best. Maybe the best movie on this entire list, and I'm talking about Toy Story 3. Wow, what a perfect end to a trilogy. If I was going to teach a class on how to end a story, how to end a franchise, a universe, a trilogy, I would show them Toy Story 3. This is how you do it. You tell the biggest and best emotional story you could possibly do where these toys are brought to this kind of uh, daycare center. They're taken away from Andy who's going to college. The themes of the movie of getting older and having to let go and move on are so relevant to me who's kind of at that same point in life that Andy was at. I'm a little bit older, but but I was still kind of at that same point of having to let go of the past and sort of go into adulthood. The, the, the toys are sort of going through that same thematical emotional arc here, and it's really sad and brutal, but also kind of hopeful. And wow, what an ending! This movie is brilliant. It's utterly brilliant. I will never forget crying my eyes out in the movie theaters as a little kid, and I still cry my eyes out when I watch this movie today. Why? Why? Why did they make a Toy Story 4? I just, I don't get it. And Toy Story 4 just kind of went over the same thematical beats as Toy Story 3. What a waste. It's not even a bad, like, I'm not saying Toy Story 4 is a bad movie, because it's not. It's just a movie that shouldn't have happened. It just doesn't make sense thematically. Nor will a Toy Story 5, which is another movie that they're making. Disney, stop. Please, stop, Disney. You can't keep getting away with it! Alright, let's go to number three. No, 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 not, not that one. Oh, dear God, not that one. No, not, not that one either. I, I like that one. We like the prequels, but unfortunately it's not one of the best. It's one of my favorite trilogies, but it's not one of the best. Of course, the original Star Wars trilogy, one of the main reasons it has to be in the top three here is because it has created what is and what will probably continue to be the largest film franchise I think Hollywood has. Not just when it comes to films, but when it comes to television and now books and everything else. Star Wars is a phenomena that I don't think we will ever see ever again in anything else. Maybe Dune is probably the closest thing that can come to it when it comes to lore and world building and how deep it can go. But still, Star Wars is just unbelievably massive and definitely wasn't also destroyed by Disney. Why is this a trend on this list? Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. Bob Iger and Kathleen Kennedy ruined, I think, like three or four of the freaking franchises I mentioned so far. What? 
Disney, go away. But the original trilogy of films is obviously perfect. Directed by George Lucas, we first start with A New Hope, which at one point was just called Star Wars. Now it's called Episode Four, A New Hope. Whatever you want to call it, either way, it was the first Star Wars movie which introduced us to the world of Star Wars. This world that is being ruled by this evil empire and this random, you know, sorcerer dude named Darth Vader who's really creepy. And there's this guy, Luke Skywalker, who's just this nerdy little idiot on this desert planet who has to come up and be the savior, the big hero. It's a classic hero story. It's an amazing story. It's a movie that is absolutely timeless. It's brilliant. It sets up all the themes of what will be the big Star Wars universe. It sets up world building for prequel films that wouldn't happen for like 20, 30 years after. It is just an incredible movie that is so iconic, and it leads directly into Empire Strikes Back, arguably the best Star Wars movie. It's an incredible film that really diverted expectations for what a second film in a universe like this would be. The first film kind of followed that classic hero mold. You have this hero who, who rises up, gains power, and saves the day at the end of the movie. The second film's gonna follow the same thing, right? The hero trains, he gets stronger, he goes, he fights Darth Vader, and they lose! That was mind-blowing. Well, I wasn't there, but I can assume that that was mind-blowing for everybody at the time seeing that movie. An incredible revolution of having the good guys get their asses handed to them in the second movie. Wow, what an idea. What a brilliant, brilliant choice. Obviously, you have the big reveal, I Am Your Father from Darth Vader, which was massive. This is just an incredible film. It's easily one of the best sci-fi movies ever, and it's what makes this trilogy as great as it is, because then we get into... Return of the Jedi, which is one of the weaker films in the Star Wars saga, but it's not a bad movie. It's just kind of not as good as the other two, but not bad at all. It's a good, solid film where Luke finally becomes a full-fledged Jedi and has to go fight his father, Darth Vader, and the Emperor, Emperor Palpatine. We see him for the first time in this movie, and uh, yeah, he dies in this movie and never comes back. He never, never shows up ever again. He's just done in this movie. Thank, thank God, because if they brought him back, that would have been really... Why, Disney? This is an epic movie, though. There's some problems with it. The Ewoks are dumb. There's a lot of kind of blank spots in this movie where it sort of drags a little bit more, but obviously the last act is absolutely iconic and brilliant, and the ending is amazing and should have been the ending of this universe. So yes, Star Wars is a top three trilogy of all time. Then we get to the top two. These are some, some hefty, hefty trilogies here. Christopher Nolan's masterpiece, in my opinion, is his Dark Knight trilogy. This is his legacy, this is what he's probably going to be remembered the most for. Even if I love some of his other films the most, this trilogy is just a remarkable accomplishment that not only brought Batman back into the fold of Hollywood, brought Batman back into the center of cinema, but it also kind of launched the crazy generation of superhero movies we had for a full decade after this, still to this day getting them. This is where it really started, 2008. I know a lot of people give credit to Iron Man, but I think it was the success of the Dark Knight trilogy that really spawned the superhero craze. Now, it started in 2004 with Batman Begins, a movie that does not get enough appreciation. The pressure and the stress that Nolan had making this movie to have to relaunch a character that had become such a joke in the eyes of Hollywood was very, very difficult. It's almost as difficult as the task James Gunn now has to relaunch the Superman franchise. It's pretty much the same exact boat, except Christopher Nolan did it in a way that was so brilliant and so amazing. Batman Begins is a perfect movie that takes the character of Batman, makes him very dark, brings him down to earth with Christian Bale, who's amazing in the movie, and we follow this emotional journey of him learning not only to become Batman, but understanding what Batman is, the symbol of hope that is also this, you know, this fearful character to scare the bad guys, but it's also a way of protecting Bruce and his family because he wants to fight crime. He wants to avenge his family and kind of bring peace to Gotham, but he also doesn't want to get them in harm's way. You have so many brilliant moments in this movie. Great villains, killing great villains, Killian Murphy playing Scarecrow, amazing, Raz al Ghul, great. This is an amazing movie that definitely does not get enough credit. It's a fantastic Batman film. It's one of the best Batman films. Then you have arguably the greatest movie ever made in The Dark Knight. Now, of course, The Dark Knight, there, there isn't much I could say about it that other people haven't already said. Obviously, Heath Ledger, amazing. The political story here between good and evil and kind of fighting over prosecutors and fighting over mayors and the government of Gotham and taking down crime families and how that all kind of culminates with this coin flip of a story between Batman and Joker, good, evil, tugging at the heartstrings of Gotham. It's really a brilliant story that ramps up into a perfect third act. This is an amazing movie. I could talk about it for hours. I'm going to stop talking about it just because everybody's seen this movie and loves it, and they've heard millions of people talk about it. But then we have The Dark Knight Rises, a movie that gets a lot of hate. You know why it gets a lot of hate? Because it's not as good as The Dark Knight. 
That's an unfair comparison, though, because The Dark Knight Rises is better than the vast majority of comic book movies we get every year. It is a phenomenal, phenomenal movie that takes Batman and he brings him down to our level. He makes him even more human and broken and battered, and he makes him have to build back up again to fight Bane, one of the best villains of comic book history, played brilliantly by Tom Hardy. Now, this movie is a little more kind of generic than The Dark Knight when it comes to superhero movies. It's generic in the sense that you have this big, bad, strong villain who has a big army, and he takes over a city, and you gotta fight him. It's not as intricate and as, you know, kind of decisive as the previous two movies when it comes to its strategic writing with characters and stories and world building. But at the same time, it's still a brilliant movie that brings this trilogy to a perfect uh, conclusion to a spot that makes it just work amazingly as a thematical trilogy of films. It's easily one of the best trilogies ever. It's definitely the best trilogy of superhero movies we've ever gotten, and it definitely deserves to be number two here. But there is one more trilogy that's slightly better. I gotta put it slightly above. And you all know what it- you knew it was gonna be here before you even clicked on the video. Now, The Lord of the Rings is actually why I sort of made this video, because while I was thinking about Dune, and I've been thinking about the potential of Dune Part 3, I was thinking, wow, the closest thing Dune, the closest thing to Dune that we've ever had is the Lord of the Rings trilogy, an epic spanning three movies that bleed into each other, that tell a grand, epic, world-building, fantasy-type story, and that's what the Lord of the Rings is. Now, this is a trilogy that I'm going to be honest, I didn't grow up on it. I didn't watch it till the last year. I experienced this trilogy for the first time about a year ago, and I finally kind of understood what all the hype was about this universe and about this world. These movies are a remarkable achievement, and I wish I was there when they were coming out, or I wish I got to experience them as a kid, because I might have a greater appreciation than I already have, but God, man, these movies are so fascinating. First, we start with The Fellowship of the Ring, which really introduces you to the world of Middle-earth and introduces you to all the characters in the story between Frodo, between Gandalf, between, between Aragon, all these characters that just all are written so well and are performed so great, and you can't help but to love every single one of them and want to see a lot of them, which is great because we have a lot of movie here, so we get to see a good amount of them. The, the journey of Frodo and the Fellowship kind of having to take this ring and travel to Mordor and, you know, destroy the ring is a really great jumping off point for this trilogy. And although we only get to see the Fellowship together for a short period of time, there's something, and I know everybody talks about it, that scene when they come together for the first time and they're all talking about what to do and the Fellowship really comes together. There's something so magical about that scene that gets you so excited. I, I do think this movie peaks in that part of the movie, which is about the middle half. That first act and second act definitely sort of peak, and then the third act falls flat a little bit, but then it rises at the end of it, and it makes for an epic, epic movie that is a brilliant opening to this trilogy. And then you go right into The Two Towers, which is my personal favorite of the trilogy, which, by the way, the balls they had to release this movie in 2001. What the fuck were they thinking releasing a movie called The Two Towers in 2001? That wouldn't happen today. I'm just gonna put that out there. Uh, this movie's brilliant. It takes everything that happened in the first movie and just expands on it. This movie's more epic. It's more brilliant. You have great, awesome battles. That nighttime battle that happens later in the movie is unreal. It is one of the most epic things I've ever seen in my life. The opening of this movie. Oh my god. It's incredible. Everything about Frodo's journey with Sam as they really, as they meet Gollum and everything that happens with Gollum is so brilliantly done and Andy Serkis is so amazing as Gollum. This movie is utterly brilliant. I think it's the highlight of this trilogy, and I think it's one of the best movies ever made. Just my opinion. I know a lot of people think that about the third movie, which I'll get into in a second, but I think Two Towers is just utterly perfect. The battles in this movie, the music, everything. This is the movie where I finally realized why this franchise is loved as much as it is, because it's just, it sucks you in, and you feel so happy and jolly watching it, but you feel like you're on the adventure with these characters, and it's awesome. And then we get to Return of the King. This is a movie that I it's hard for me to talk about because I'm going to say things that you've heard people say a billion times about Return of the King. It's a perfect end to a trilogy. It culminates all of the storylines that have been branching off since Fellowship of the Ring, and it brings them all together in epic battles, epic fights, epic thematical moments, epic dialogue scenes, big moments with Frodo, with Sam, with Gollum, with Aragon. You have awesome, awesome battles. One of the best final battles in any film ever. You have some of the coolest visual effects and practical effects you're ever going to see. You just feel so amazing by the end of this movie, so emotional. There's some real hard-hitting gut punch moments that aren't really, like, sad, but are just getting teared up because they're beautiful, man. This is a great movie. It deservingly so won Best Picture at the Academy Awards, which is amazing that a trilogy ender won that award. It's a film that is easily going to live in the minds of everybody who's seen it today and, and forever in Hollywood. It's going to be one of the most iconic Hollywood films 
ever made. And it's one of the reasons this franchise is as popular and as huge as it is at the moment. And, and it's a movie that, although I do think The Two Towers is slightly, slightly better, it's a movie that I easily think is a masterpiece and one of the greatest franchise films ever made. Whew. That's the video, guys. That was a lot of talking. I did not expect to talk as much as I did. Let me know, though, what are your favorite movie trilogies down below, and where do you think Dune is going to end up on this list after Dune Messiah? Personally, if Dune Messiah is as good as Dune Part 1 and Dune Part 2, it's going to be top three on a list like this, because, my God, is Dune Part 2 a masterpiece. But yeah, let me know what you think. Let me know where you disagree. Click the video on the screen right now, and I will see you guys tomorrow. Also, make sure to subscribe.